what's up what's the weatherman here and it might be a better man near because it's two members of team 6k in the building what's up undead what's up weatherman welcome back guys to team 6k welcome to the 1000 subscriber special and make sure you stick around to the end of the video because we're gonna have two special announcements for the channel and for you guys so make sure you stick around to see that if you've seen our channels before chances are you've seen us giving guides on how to play decks but often we say that you can still build your deck the way you choose to do so However, that doesn't mean that every deck building decision somebody makes is automatically good. It just means that everybody has the right to make their own decisions. But if you feel like you're a good duelist, yet there's something holding you back, there is a good chance that you might need to upgrade your deck building skills. This video is gonna teach you everything you need to know about deck building theory and duel links to help you become a master deck builder so you can win the battle before it even begins. When beginning to build a deck, the first thing you need to keep in mind is that the entire deck has to act as one cohesive strategy. Every card has to have a part to play that contributes to the entire deck's game plan. That means if there's a card in your deck that doesn't contribute to your game plan, it should be cut out of the deck, even if it is a powerful card. Playing so many of your favorite cards in your deck is gonna lead to situations where your hand is full of cards that are good cards without any doubt, but increase the chance that your strategy itself isn't gonna be able to get started. It doesn't matter how backbreaking your favorite card is. If you don't have a way to get your deck strategy happening, then your opponent will be able to recover and steal the game away from you. I'm not saying don't play staples. In fact, staples are a great addition to most decks as they provide you with more ways to counteract your opponent's strategy and to protect your own strategy. However, we only have so many deck slots in the deck, we can't play them all, so if we have to choose what staples we play, we pick the ones that benefit our strategy the best. If our deck needs more ways to play through back row, we can play back row removal. And if our deck doesn't care so much about back row, then playing back row removal isn't gonna be that useful. In dual links, when our deck size is 20, it means that we're more likely to see any of the given cards in our deck than a TCG player is with their 40 card deck. So if you play just one copy of your favorite card, it may let you down by being in your hand when you don't need it. That's why we need to optimize our deck by cutting the fat and only playing cards that are always good and that work together well with our deck strategy. If you want to play more than one strategy in your deck, like a mix between blue eyes and red eyes, you're often gonna find yourself in situations where you don't have enough of the right cards in your hand to get either strategy going. And you're very likely gonna be in a situation where you can't follow up properly because of the lack of cohesion between the two different strategies. I'm sorry guys, but both being dragon cards is not synergy. Sometimes though, two strategies can come together to become one strategy, but only if they both benefit each other in a way that they are better together than they are apart. When putting two strategies together, ask yourself, is this better than if I were to simply play one of these strategies by itself? If the new strategy is better than one of them, but worse than the other, then that means that the first one is holding the other back and the other should just be played alone. If they are both worse than they are alone, then that means they are taken away from each other's consistency. If they are equally as powerful together as they are separate, then they shouldn't be played together because they're not really benefiting from each other. They are only breaking even and that kind of invalidates the mix entirely. One thing that many duelists are unaware of is the reasons you might play a certain amount of cards in your deck. Let's break it down. We all know you can play between one and three copies of a card. Why would we play three copies of a card? Well, if we want to see a card in our opening hand, playing the maximum amount of that card increases the chance that we will draw it. Three out of 20 is much better odds than one out of 20. In fact, that is literally tripling your odds, so of course you'd play three. What cards would we want to see in our opening hand? Most importantly, cards that get our deck's strategy going. If we want our strategy to be successful, then we want to make sure it happens as consistently as possible. So we do everything we can to make sure it happens. So we maximize on those cards to get it started, and we are more likely to be successful. Another type of card we can play three copies of is a card that we cannot access directly from the deck, but we want to have access to it anyway. There is a lot of searching and other ways to get access to cards from the deck in this game, but sometimes cards can't be accessed from the deck by your strategy, but you still really want to have them in your hand. And in those cases, of course, you'd play three copies of it. We are going to skip right ahead to one copy now and explain why we might play two copies of something after. I know it sounds weird, but it'll make sense when we get there, trust me. If our strategy does allow us to access a card from our deck, but we don't really want or need to see it in our hand, then we play one copy of it. 
This might be because the card is necessary to your strategy but bad in your hand, or it might just be that your strategy is so consistent that you'll never need it to see it in your hand as you can guarantee that you'll always be able to access it anyway. This brings us to why we might play two copies of a card, and the reasons are pretty much the same as why we might play one card, except they have a little bit more nuance to them. We might either need to use two copies during a duel for our overall strategy, or it might be that if you have a copy of a card in your hand, your strategy simply won't work, so you play a second copy to be in your deck, just in case one is in your hand, so that your strategy can still be successful. An example of this is Mermaid Orcist. They play two copies of Orcist Nightmare, even though they only need one copy, because they still need to be able to summon it specifically from the deck in order to get their play started so having it in their hand is a bad thing. When it comes to the extra deck, we almost always play one copy of any card in the extra deck, because we will always have access to our extra deck. The reason you might play more copies of any cards in your extra deck is if your strategy will be able to make use of multiple copies. For example, in Resonators, they play multiple copies of Red Rising Dragon, because over the course of a duel, they will surely be able to summon multiple copies of it. If we want to win our duels, or at the very least, if we want to be able to do what our deck aims to do, then we need our deck to be built in such a way that we have the best chance of being able to successfully bring our game plan into fruition. In order to do this, we need our decks to be consistent, meaning that we have the best chance of having what we need to do what we need to do. In order to be consistent, we have to consider the math involved in our decks makeup. Just now we talked about ratios and that if you had three copies of a card in your deck, you are more likely to draw it than if you only had one of it in your deck. If the card that you use to begin playing your strategy is at three copies in your deck, then roughly half of the time you will have that card in your opening hand. So roughly half the time that means you'll be able to get your plays started. But we want to always get our plays started. So when building your deck, you need to have more than just three cards in your deck to get you started. For example, if you have three cards in your deck that got your play started, you would have roughly an 80% chance of having a play starter in your opening hand. Many archetypes are designed with deck building mathematics in mind, so they provide duelists with more than one card that gets their play started, so the duelists can play three copies of each of those starter cards so that they can have a great consistency. Often people will make sure that seven or eight of their main slots out of a 20 card deck represent a starter card. That being by being a starter itself or by searching for a starter. Every card you put in your deck that represents a starter card increases your chance of getting that starter card but of course if you play too many starter cards then you won't have enough room for the other kind of cards in your deck so playing between six and nine is a good idea we just talked about starter cards but we also mentioned that there are other kinds of cards in the game of course and we can split the usable ones into two more categories extenders and impact cards an extender is a card that while it might not be able to get your plays started by itself it will allow your plays to go further as long as you have a starter for some decks having two extenders itself can be a starting play but for the sake of this explanation let's keep it simple if i have a speedroid terra top which is a starter i can guarantee that i'll be able to put crystal wing on the field however if i have the extension card speedroid double yo-yo i will be able to do more than just a crystal wing extenders because of the fact that they help your play to continue past just the bare minimum are cards that we should always consider when building a deck the fact that they can help us to keep playing also means that they can often allow us to continue playing after the opponent has prevented some of what our starter was trying to achieve. Since these cards are not within themselves starters, we shouldn't be trying to make them our top priority when building our deck, but because they do make our decks more powerful, we should make sure to include them at an amount that makes sense, whether they be searchable or whether we play more copies of them, so that we are able to have access to them to make ourselves a more imposing force on the duel. Impact cards are often the most powerful kinds of cards in the game. However, these powerful effects are the only things that they can do, as they cannot get your play started and they cannot extend your plays. All they are is a one-time usage effect to leave an impact on the duel to swing things in your favor. Staple cards are an example of an impact card. You can use them to interrupt your opponent or protect yourself from being interrupted, kind of like a stim pack that you can use once and then discard, and that one effect might have just been enough to help you get back into the swing of things and win the duel. It can be tempting to play a lot of impact cards as the more you play the more you will be able to leave a lasting impact on the duel. However playing too many might have a negative effect on your consistency because those deck slots might be better used for your starters and extenders. A deck like Shura Nui from 2020 could play a lot of impact cards because their starters were all they needed to access their entire game plan. So they put all of their starters and engine requirements into the deck and often had 10 to 12 slots left so they could throw in 
a bunch of impact cards in the form of trap cards mostly, leading to their nickname Bakro Nui. Not every deck can beneficially do something like this, as not every deck can do as much with just one card. That doesn't make your deck bad if it doesn't do everything with one card, it just means that your deck will be focusing less on impact cards and more on starters and extenders. The balance of starters, extenders and impact cards is what makes the most difference when you are building a deck, so finding the right ratios of each for your strategy is going to be key. Some cards can fit under multiple of these categories and that is great, it makes deck building much easier. When you're looking at a strategy that you want to build for a deck, you might have ideas in your head for what you want it to do for you. You might be able to find or figure out combos that the strategy can do, and you might want to focus on that. This is a very fun process, but there's something that not enough people do when they are looking at a strategy, and that is finding out what the strategy itself wants to do. If you ask a fish to fly and a bird to swim, the fish might learn to jump and the bird might learn to dive. However, neither of them would be as good as the animals that are designed to do what they are trying to do. If they instead focused on what they were naturally good at, then they might have a good chance at being the best they can possibly be. So when you take cards from a strategy and find what they can accomplish easily and you hone in on that, this is something that you shouldn't try to stray away from. You can definitely have different avenues available, but not to the detriment of what is natural to the strategy. This is because if you are pushed into a corner, you won't have the luxury of making decisions. You will only be able to do what the cards will allow you to do. So building your deck so that you are rewarded for the cards doing what they want to do will benefit you in the long run. This is how we like to interpret the heart of the cards. Not as some magical anime power that lets you draw whatever you want whenever you want it, but as an understanding of how your cards work and interact and taking advantage of what they are good at rather than trying to force them into doing something that they aren't very good at. Believe in the heart of the cards in this way and they will believe in you too. Understanding the kind of deck your strategy is is going to be helpful when deciding what cards to support it. The four main types of decks are combo, control, mid-range, and anti-meta. Combo decks focus around achieving a particular scenario quickly and hoping to win that game off of the power of their opening play, so that even if the opponent breaks your opening board, their opening play was impactful enough so that their follow-up play can simply finish the opponent off. Combo decks, because of how fast they achieve their win condition, are the kind of deck that if you don't stop them, they very well could win the game, so people will prioritize playing interruptions in order to prevent them from overwhelming them. Because everyone will try to interrupt you, your own win condition is already powerful enough, so you won't need to fill your deck with the kind of impact cards that interrupt the opponent. You only need to play impact cards that protect your own strategy. Control decks focus around dictating the pace of the duel slowing things down so that they can gradually accrue enough advantage to win the game in a big explosive turn. They tend to do this by having starters that give them an engine that keeps them in the duel over the course of multiple turns just by itself, so that they don't need to focus on extenders that heavily, leaving them lots of room for interruptive impact cards. Because of the fact that they aim to win the long game, they don't need to worry so much about if they are interrupted because they will always be able to keep going later. So control decks don't need many, if any, protective impact cards, they mainly just need interruptive impact cards. Mid-range decks are the kind of deck that can adapt to their environment, they can speed up their game plan to win quickly, to prevent the opponent from overtaking them in advantage, or they can slow down in order to gradually weaken a powerful opponent, or they can race another mid-range deck in a battle of dominance. Mid-range decks, while they don't put up the strongest opening plays and they don't accrue as much advantage as a control deck, their adaptability makes them versatile, and this versatility is reflected in the cards they can put into their deck. They often play both interruptive and protective impact cards, and they often play impact cards that are both interruptive and protective at the same time. Anti-meta decks aim only to invalidate popular strategies. By playing card that while they aren't usually that impactful, they are incredibly impactful in very specific matchups. When analyzing which decks are popular, an anti-meta deck will put cards into their deck that will be incredibly good against those popular decks, even if they aren't good against every deck. It's always important when building your deck that your game plan is coherent, all of your cards agree with each other, and they all contribute to achieving the same goal. However, we must never forget that this is a two-player game, and our opponents will present us with difficult situations that we must either answer or fall flat from. Let's say the opponent has a card that cannot be destroyed by battle or card effects, and every card in your deck that you would normally use to remove cards from the opponent's field, do so by destroying them by battle or by card effect. Now, you're in a situation that you either lose, 
or you'll have cars that'll help you. This is something you would much rather think about when you're building your deck than regret not thinking about it after it happened. So make sure that your deck has a coherent way that fits well within your game plan to answer difficult scenarios. One way many decks do this is by having either searchable main deck cards or extra deck cards that can remove monsters without destroying them or remove monsters without targeting them as they are two of the most popular and difficult forms of protection. Make sure that whatever way you choose to deal with these things, it is naturally possible with your deck's game plan without having to use up too much of your card advantage to do so. Otherwise, your loss in card advantage will mean you used up a lot of cards to deal with one card. And that'll mean the opponent still has the advantage and you want to have the advantage after getting rid of their boss monster. Sometimes in a vacuum, a deck might be built perfectly with beautiful coherence, perfect consistency, perfect synergy, a well-designed game plan and contingency plan and perfect ratios, but it might not be enough to compete in a given format. One of the most important things to take into account when you are building your deck is your opponents. Who are you going to fight against? If you know your enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not your enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. This quote by Sun Tzu from his book The Art of War applies perfectly to deck building in Yu-Gi-Oh. If you know your deck perfectly, that is wonderful and you will certainly win games. However, your opponents will also be able to defeat you if you don't know about their decks. But if you do research into all of the decks people are playing actively and you learn as much as you can about those decks, then you might be able to use your own strategy to counter them better than you would otherwise. You might even be able to change your deck up a bit to be better suited to the matchups that you should expect in a given format. A great example of this is that I had been playing Mystical Space Typhoon in many decks because I felt like if I was backed into a corner and I could draw it from the top of my deck in a tough situation, there was a higher chance that I would be able to activate it as opposed to Cosmic Cyclone which has a life point requirement that I might not be able to pay. However, when Orcus became a popular deck in the meta, I knew that one of the most highly expected matchups would be Orcus, which can protect its whole field from destruction effects. The niche situation that caused me to choose Mystical Space Typhoon over Cosmic Cyclone now became irrelevant because now Cosmic is the card that will be active in more situations, as no matter what deck I go against, Cosmic is getting rid of back row, while if I play Mystical Space Typhoon, it won't work against Orcus at all. So, I switched out MST for Cosmic Cyclone, all because of knowledge gained from research on popular trends in the meta. This is something that can be done in every format and that's why every format's decks might be built differently even if the game plan is exactly the same. Keeping all of these things in mind is going to make you a better deck builder and the better you get at deck building and the more likely you are to win. So it's like you are also increasing your dueling skill without even needing dueling practice because you might already be the perfect dueling competence level but need another step further to get some real success. We at Team 6K feel so blessed to have had 1,000 of you subscribe to us. It already feels like we are community. And whenever we see you guys commenting, we remember you from your comments on our other videos. And we really appreciate the love and support you've been giving. It gives us a lot of motivation to keep putting up the kind of content that you guys want to see. We've noticed that the Duel Links YouTube landscape is a lot of deck lists being shared and not a whole lot of explanations going on. So all of us are just left to try to figure it out ourselves, teach ourselves, and we might not figure out how it works at all, or it might not even be a good deck because the YouTuber that showed us may have just been lucky, or maybe they were a genius, or you don't even know because there's not a whole lot of explanations. And that's why we go out of our way to explain all of our thought processes when we talk about our decks. And that's why we went really in depth about talking about our deck building theories today. But we aren't gonna stop today. We're gonna keep making advanced guys and we're gonna try to see you all become guys of dueling. To that end, we've got a couple of announcements to make. First of all, we have put up a community Discord for all of you guys to join to talk about dueling links, Yu-Gi-Oh in general, anime, gaming, whatever, we want this community to feel like a big internet family. Check out the link in the description to join and we will be looking forward to seeing you all there. Second of all, we're going to start a series where we're going to help you get that deck right. We're going to fix your deck. All you got to do is follow me at Team 6K Weather on Twitter. Tweet a screenshot of your deck list at me. Tell me what you aim to achieve with it. Make sure to include the hashtag 6KFixK. Otherwise, you won't be able to see it. We will try our best to put them in the right direction in the video, so make sure to follow Follow Team 6K Weather on Twitter and include that hashtag to send in your deck list. And join the Discord to become part of the 6K community. But yeah, guys, if you like the video, like the video. Subscribe if you're new around here. Hit that bell to get notified every time we make a new video. I've been Undead. I've been Weatherman. Team, Team 6K, 6K out. Wait, hey, I feel like the greatest. Okay. Now I feel like they hate it. Okay. Now I feel like the only one and there is no debating. Okay. Man, I feel like they leaving. Now I feel like they waited. Now I feel like this is the feeling before 
I can make it Before I hit the stage, I just feel like I'm nauseous Or I feel like I'm popping, or I feel like a boss is Maybe I'm feeling off it, or I feel like I'm toxic Maybe feeling intoxicated is the reason for all this I wanna whip it with the top down, dog, like I'm Earth Gang Told him, listen, wild day shine like my first name Told me go and grab a titty, boy, it's my first chain I ain't even switch gears yet, it's the first lane The first pain I ever felt was the worst pain And church came, and that feeling of hurt came And her name made this feeling all worth pain She made me realize what I had felt in the first place